Hello, I'm Daniel Benjamin, and I am the president of the American Academy in Berlin. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the Anna Maria Kellen lecture uh, this spring entitled James Baldwin, the Making of an American Icon. The lecture will be delivered by Professor Robert Reed Farr, who is this semester's Anna Maria Kellen Fellow at the American Academy. I'm especially delighted to see Robert on screen here because although we met online before, uh, we are now actually online and in the same city. Robert just arrived at the Academy. He's in quarantine, um, but fortunately quarantine is no bar to participating in an online event. The Anna Maria and Kellen Berlin Prize is annually funded by the Anna Maria and Stephen Kellen Foundation and the descendants of Hans and Ludmilla Arnold, um, who provided the American Academy with its founding gift and who continue their exceptionally generous support. Uh, Anna Maria Kellen was the daughter of Hans and Ludmilla Arnold. And as those of you who are familiar with the Academy know, uh, we are located in the former villa of, Hans Ar of the Hans Arnold family on the Wannsee in Berlin. Of course, we're sorry we can't hold this year's Kellen lecture in person, but judging by uh, the incredible turnout and the remarkable list of people who've signed up for this event, we're enjoying uh, the unlikely benefit of having scholars and interested individuals from all over the world tune in. So I wanna thank you for joining us. Um, clearly um, we did the right thing in selecting Robert Reed Farr because he's turning out an enormous audience. And hello from Berlin to everyone who is joining us from the US, Europe and around the world. Now, my job is pretty humble tonight. I get to introduce the introducer. Uh, and I'm pleased um, that uh, our introducer tonight does not himself need a long introduction because many of you know him well um, as a colleague or perhaps as your teacher, Frank Kelleter, one of uh, the best known uh, German experts on American studies is uh, the chair of the Department of Culture and Einstein Professor of North American Cultural History at the John F. Kennedy Institute for North American Studies at the Freie Universität Berlin. His main fields of interest include the American colonial and enlightenment periods, theories of American modernity, and American media and popular culture since the 19th century. Among his recent publications are The Media of Serial Narrative, David Bowie, which was published in 2016, Serial Agencies, The Wire and Its Reader, which came out in 2014, and Populaire Serialität, which was an edited volume that came out in 2012. So Frank and Robert know each other well. They've worked together in the past uh, and their cooperation continues in the framework of the African Atlantic Research Group, which was formed during two workshops in Berlin in June, 2017 and New York City uh, in April of the following year. Uh, I hope they'll tell you more about that research and about themselves. And so again, thank you for joining us, Frank and uh, the virtual podium is yours. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's great that the introducer gets an introduction here. Yeah. Uh, but so uh, uh, welcome everyone. And now it is my uh, a real pleasure to introduce uh, Robert Reed Farr today. Um, as you have probably seen on the announcement for this event, uh, Robert is professor of African American and African studies, uh, as well as professor of gender and sexuality studies at Harvard University. Um, but uh, uh, as you have heard, uh, he is also, and I'm speaking now for the Kennedy Institute here in Berlin, uh, for us at the Kennedy Institute, uh, he is also and especially a close friend and, uh, and a frequent uh, a visitor and a uh, yeah, constant inspiration. So much so, in fact, that I uh, cannot even imagine the Kennedy Institute without him anymore. Huh. Um, so uh, I first met Robert, uh, at about the time when I myself uh, came to Berlin, a uh, little less than 10 years ago. Um, and uh, at the time, I certainly knew about his work back then, but uh, I must admit that I hadn't read any of it yet at that time. Uh, so I first got to know Robert not on paper as a, as a, as a brilliant scholar, uh, but, but in real life, so to speak, uh, uh, as, a, as a wonderful colleague. Uh, and, and actually also as a, as a real fun person to hang out with uh, in bars and restaurants in uh, Berlin and New York. Um, and uh, all of this was uh, uh, great and we had uh, uh, many, many good conversations. Um, 
but what really blew me away then uh, was his writing, uh, uh, the radical brilliance of his writing and also the beauty of his writing. Uh, so shortly after we met, uh, uh, I started reading Robert's books. Uh, so I read Once You Roll Black from uh, 2007, subtitled Choice, Desire, and the Black American Intellectual. I read Black Gay Men with two commas in the title, uh, a collection of essays published in 2001. Uh, and then later, of course, uh, uh, I read the amazing book, Archives of Flesh, African America, Spain, and Post-Humanist Critique from 2016. And these books, all of them published by NYU Press, um, these books are um, difficult to summarize, especially on an occasion like this one, uh, because so much of their argument depends on their form and on their language. And I would actually say on their aesthetics. So you really cannot talk about the scholar Robert Reed Farr without talking about the writer Robert Reed Farr. Um, and precisely this, I think, makes it so uh, fortunate, so logical almost, that Robert's new book, the one that he's going to talk about tonight, uh, that this is about uh, James Baldwin, who of course also practiced writing as a political art. Uh, who wrote about politics always as something that happens between human bodies. Uh, politics as a matter of nervous systems touching each other, sensing each other, often colliding with each other and doing harm to each other. And I think this Baldwinian understanding of politics as an always physical affair, I think this resonates quite deeply with some of Robert's main insights and achievements as a writer. Um, because when we read Robert Reed Farr, I think we begin to understand that many of the concepts that we depend on as scholars or historians, um, abstract concepts such as culture or uh, uh, identity or sexuality, um, that these abstractions can become politically concrete and useful only when the writing that articulates them lives up to the experience that has produced them. Um, so there's a politics of embodiment, or actually to use one of Robert's favorite terms, a politics of intimacy mm. at the heart of Robert's work, but also at the heart of James Baldwin's work, I would say. Um, and it is this politics of intimacy, I think, uh, that let Robert begin one of his books, Archives of Flesh, uh, uh, with a sentence that is uh, really astounding, I think, uh, uh, in its simplicity, in its poignant simplicity. Because the first sentence of Archives of Flesh in 2016 reads, I might as well begin with the truth. <laughs> I might as well begin with the truth. What a way to start an academic book. Um, and it turns out that this is not just a rhetorical gesture because the truth that Robert talks about then in the book, um, this is a personal truth that is at the same time a historical truth. So Robert begins his book about African America, Spain and post-humanist critique with a memory, a memory of how together with his sister, he got onto a bus in 1971 and this bus drove, him, uh, drove them uh, from his family's working class black neighborhood uh, to one of North Carolina's newly desegregated schools. And it was there uh, that he first realized that the white liberal project of racial integration, uh, that this relied on notions of humanism that have already violated the humanity of those it defines as objects of integration. Uh, or in Robert's own words, and, and let me quickly quote this here also to give you a sense of his, of his writing. The fact that in all its foundations and practices, the United States is a profoundly segregated society had become so apparent as to make it clear that no institution in the nation is immune to the charge of either white supremacy or mediocrity. Mm -hmm. The breathless self-congratulations of liberal America notwithstanding. Um, 
in, in Robert's work, this insight cuts deep. In fact, it cuts all the way down to the core of our academic profession, uh, a profession to which Robert claims an awkward allegiance, as he writes. And from this perspective, the perspective of a necessarily awkward allegiance, the history of Western humanism, and by the way, this then includes the history of some of its key institutions, such as schools and universities or academies. This history cannot be separated from the histories of Western colonialism and racial capitalism and capitalist urbanization. Um, Robert's project, therefore, which I take to be an intellectual as well as an aesthetic project. Uh, this project suggests that the very epistemologies of European thought are themselves affected by an empirical history of violence that cannot simply be subtracted from you know, the writings of, let's say, Locke or Hegel or Heidegger, um, uh, as if we could arrive that way um, uh, at some supposedly uncontaminated philosophy of, of universal being or humanity. What we need instead is what Robert calls, and I quote again, an apparatus of distrust that, quote, resists at every turn the tyranny of philosophy and sociology, <laughs> end of quote. But that's not all, because the ethos of writing that sustains this project never settles for, you know, an easy hermeneutics of suspicion or negativity. On the contrary, Robert's achievement as a writer consists, in, and I really admire him for this, Robert, Robert's achievement as a writer, I think, consists precisely in enabling and imagining what he calls the beginnings of a post-humanist archival practice. That is, archives of flesh, a term that he takes from Horton Spillers, which means the way I understand it, to faithfully reconstruct embodied historical struggles and to narrate them in a language that makes their lived reality intelligible again, each time anew. Just as Robert insists elsewhere that our academic histories of sexuality need to be able to use the words and to faithfully describe the acts that animate real sexual lives. And doesn't this remind us of James Baldwin indeed? Mm -hmm. um, so when I first heard that Robert is working on uh, what at the time he was still reluctant to call a biography of Baldwin, um, uh, my first thought was uh, uh, what a perfect match. I mean, how lucky we are as readers to get to see and read James Baldwin through the eyes of Robert Reed Farr. And also to see Robert Reed Farr continue his work as a scholar and as a writer in dialogue uh, uh, with one of the most important essayists and novelists of the 20th century in any language. Um, so I think this is a very special occasion tonight. Uh, uh, and uh, for all of you in the audience, thank you for uh, uh, joining us. Um, you cannot see each other for reasons of connectivity, uh, but uh, I can see who is here and Robert can see who is here. Uh, and you will get to ask questions in the Q&A afterwards. Um, but first, as I said, uh, it is my uh, great and genuine pleasure uh, to welcome on behalf of the American uh, Academy, one of the nicest and smartest people I know, uh, so please join me virtually, which I guess means silently, uh, join me in welcoming Robert Reed Farr. So Robert, it's your turn now. Thank you, um, Frank, so much for those um, very, very kind words. Uh, as um, we say in the States, I'm a little bit mad with you now because you've got me all up in my feelings. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll forgive you later about it. Um, and I just want to say um, before I go on um, that I want to, I know that we have um, limited time. I'll read for about uh, half an hour, um, certainly less than 35 minutes, but it is a pleasure for me to be um, at the American Academy. And also, um, I also want to thank Daniel and uh, all of the folks at the American Academy who have had such a grand hand in, um, in getting us together during these very, very difficult times, but times that I think, um, I believe, are a moment of um, progressive and positive change for all of us. I hope that to be the case. 
Um, and then I wanted to also um, thank the Anna Maria and Stephen um, um, Foundation um, uh, for um, having uh, funded this particular uh, fellowship. And then finally, I want to say that um, I'm sitting now in um, the former residence of the Arnold family. So I moved um, to be able to um, use this space, uh, hopefully in a way that is uh, positive uh, for us all. Um, the part, what I'm going to read to you is a section, um, actually two sections from um, the introduction um, to the new book. Uh, again, it'll take about 35 minutes. So relax and hopefully enjoy it. On May 17, 1963, a drawing of the handsomely smiling face of the famously complicated American intellectual James Baldwin appeared on the cover of Time magazine. The drawing and the author profile that accompanied it were intended to expand and focus the magazine's anxiously produced cover story, Birmingham and Beyond, the Negro's push for equality. The tone of the article was one of shock and confusion at the vigor and militancy of the Birmingham, Alabama civil rights campaign spearheaded by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC. Birmingham held the laser sharp attention of the nation as the citizens of the magic city vividly demonstrated not only the violent desperation of Southern white supremacists intent upon holding the city as a last ignoble bastion of segregation, but also the fact that the nation's presumably docile population of deep South Negroes was as prepared for long-term resistance and furious confrontation as any community in the United States. By May of 1963, Birmingham was broiling with conflict and violence. Schools, restaurants, and water fountains were closed to Blacks. The city had relinquished its professional baseball franchise rather than play integrated teams. The New York-based Metropolitan Opera no longer visited because, uh, be visited because officials refused to integrate the municipal auditorium. And in a move composed of both hubris and distraction, officials closed the public parks rather than, than abide by a 1962 court order mandating the equal use of the facilities. Intent upon suppressing the insurgents, white saboteurs reverted with gusto to the worst forms of anti-Black terrorism. Particularly fond of cross burnings, white militants ignited dozens of the structures in a futile effort to cow protesting and boycotting African-American citizens. Worse still, were the continual bombings that targeted at least 18 black homes, businesses, and churches. These already grim and repellent acts were answered in the fall of 1963 by the September 15th bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church, a deed that wounded 22 individuals and killed four young girls, Addie Mae Collins, Carol Robertson, Cynthia Wesley, and Denise McNair. This obscenity coming after months of beatings, arrests, fire hoses, and police dogs unleashed torrents of black outrage and white liberal shock that helped smooth the path to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Birmingham and the nation were certainly not free. They were, however, forever changed. The fact that Baldwin's image was used as a vehicle to help bridge the gap between Times' mildly liberal readers and the complexity of the US racial situation speaks volumes about the social and ideological realities that the gifted young writer was asked to negotiate. The Time editors thought that with the poised, youthful, and charismatic Baldwin, they had finally found a Negro with the tone, demeanor, and range to translate between the mutually unintelligible black and white languages that dominate so much within American culture. There's a long gaping valley of confusion and diffusion, Time wrote. It is a great uncharted space where leaders follow and followers lead, for there is no certainty of plan or purpose there. Negro author James Baldwin has illuminated this gray gulf with bolts of intellectual lightning. The journal then relentlessly painted Baldwin as an eloquent centrist 
holding the reasonable ground somewhere between the Negro chauvinism of Malcolm X and the lack of political skill presumably shown by Martin King. Baldwin gazes across the Gulf aware that that Gulf cannot be bridged by law alone. The Baldwin delivered to the public by time was always eager to stress matters of aesthetics and personal trauma over economics and social justice. He was as concerned with the petite quotidian tragedies that punctuate the lives of African-American people as he was with the massive issues confronting both the United States and the broader world. In a particularly telling portrayal of the emotional damage purportedly done to African-Americans by the unrelenting white supremacy of their country, Tom quoted Baldwin, ventriloquized him really, in order to suggest that the protests in Birmingham were not about jobs, housing, civil rights, and liberties, but instead the need to recuperate the wounded psyche of African America. Strolling down a quiet street in a small town, James Baldwin came upon a scene that has since haunted his dreams. From a sunlit patch of grass came the singing laughter of a child. The Baldwin looked and saw a white man swinging his little daughter in the air. It didn't last but for a second, recalls Baldwin, but it was an unforgettable touch of beauty, a glimpse of another world. Then I looked down and saw a shadow. The shadow was a nigger, me. The article then goes on to inform us that for Baldwin, this scene reveals everything worth knowing about the black man's view of himself in 20th century white America. It also reveals we were told much about James Baldwin himself. The gifted writer was decidedly not a Negro leader. He tries no civil rights cases in the courts, preaches from no pulpit, devises no stratagems for sit-ins, freedom riders, or street marchers. Most Negroes still do not know his name. He is nervous, slight. He is a nervous, slight, almost fragile figure filled with threats and fears. He is effeminate in a manner, drinks considerably, smokes cigarettes in chains, and he often loses his audience with his overblown arguments. Nevertheless, in the United States today, there is not another writer, white or black, who expresses with such poignancy and abrasiveness the dark realities of the racial ferment in North and South. I cannot help but be surprised by the hostility directed at Baldwin and the strangely discordant appreciation of the author in just a handful of sentences, he's referred to as both a shadow and a nigger. He is nervous, slight, fragile, fretful, fearful, and effeminate. He drinks and smokes too much. He has no particular portfolio and his arguments are overblown. Yet there is not another writer in the United States better suited to the unlikely role of Negro Jeremiah. To be absolutely blunt then, the writers and reporters at time, presumably representing the whole of the American public desperately needed the awkwardly constructed carnivalesque image they believed they had discovered in James Baldwin. It was in an astonishing dispatch posted from Times San Francisco Bureau by Roger Stone on May 9, 1963, in preparation for the larger article, that the strange image of Baldwin's encountering his own grotesque shadow first appeared. Stone titled the dispatch, The Shadow Was a Nigger, Take One and introduced Baldwin as, quote, an eloquent pixie with a sharp tongue, end quote. Nonetheless, his piece was designed to praise the young author. Baldwin has been somewhat of a shadow, a fugitive, an ill-formed writer, Stone announces. He then assures his readers that Baldwin's shadow is fast lengthening in the twilight of diehard segregation, that little Jimmy Baldwin is achieving full stride and in the flash of lightning that has allowed the fire next time, that has followed the fire next time, he has suddenly become the American Negro's number one spokesman. There's something telling about the fact that Stone continually references a diminutive James Baldwin in his dispatch. Little Jimmy is a pixie growing into a not yet properly established manhood. There is still time for guidance, still room for proper definition. Yet Stone comes just short of suggesting that without some form of policing and control, Baldwin celebrity might cause a fundamental threat. There is, in fact, a rapidly ascended cult being constructed around James Baldwin, he notes. A movement that sees his intellectual vigor as a step forward from the conditioned reflex action that has characterized much 
of the past civil rights movement among Negroes. Quoting a San Jose doctor, Stone goes on to inform us that civil rights has moved into an existential phase. Baldwin's articulation, both the clarity of his speech and writing, as well as the limpness of his body, the prominence of his eyes, his sparing consumption of food and stout intake of alcohol, all matters that Stone meticulously indexes in his dispatch, suggest new forms of black subjectivity about which there can be no certainty and for which there are no standard means of appraisal. Baldwin's persona is treated as monstrous, a thing quaking between past and present, the beautiful and the dreadful. Stone announces with equal measures of bravado and enmity that, quote, as a couple of Negro men watched Baldwin in action this week, one leaned across to the other and whispered, you know, he's the ugliest man I ever saw. With a thin cover of his never named black interlocutors in, space, in place, Stone proceeds to describe Baldwin as short and slight, with buggy eyes and a crazy, craggy plastic man face that he, he talks contorts into unimaginable crevices. Baldwin bounces, jitters, thrusts his hands abruptly into his pockets and then waves them in the air. He is nervous and agile and light, but what he lacks in appearance, he surely makes up for in the nimbleness of his mind and the power of his speech. If he tends to overstate his case, it is perhaps his overwhelming zeal to get his message across, warm and possessive of an uncommon degree of humanity. Baldwin has a face that could soon be forgotten, not so his lengthening shadow as it steals across the nation. It is important that we recognize that James Baldwin himself was very much aware of the complex ways in which his celebrity status was produced, announced, and exploited. By the time of the article's publication, Baldwin had not only reached national and international prominence as a writer, but also he was forced to negotiate a robust and complicated politics of celebrity and celebration that had grown up around his petite form. More important still, part of the reason that we still honor Baldwin, part of what underwrites our ability to greedily reconsume his writing, speeches, film, and television appearances is the simple fact that he was so very aware of and involved in this process. Spending a significant amount of time with a rich body of books, articles, papers, recordings, manuscripts, letters, and miscellaneous artifacts left to us by James Bolden. And one is quickly impressed by the meticulous self-confidence with which he collected and organized his archive his very broadly developed sense of himself as a public intellectual and his deep and wily understanding of how the mechanics of celebrity operates, operate. In the last interview of his life, he confessed to Quincy Troop that, quote, it's difficult to be a legend. It's hard for me to recognize me. I spend a lot of time trying to avoid it. It's unbearable the way the world treats you, especially if you're black. And you're not your legend, but you're trapped in it. The sobriety that we see on display here, the flat-footed acceptance of the fact that one enters into the public sphere via highly scripted and policed forms of both public and private discourse, demonstrates habits of thought to which Baldwin had become accustomed and in which he actively participated, sitting in his Manhattan apartment a rambling interview with Charles Childs of Cavalier magazine, Baldwin chafed at the implication that he was ever well regarded by the journalist at time. Time, time loves me about as much as it loves Gloria Richardson, which means not at all, he complained. That's a news magazine. Suppo suppose they make news their business. Oh no, heavens no. The time cover and all that jazz had nothing to do with me whatever. It had to do with the Negro's push for equality. Actually, at the time, I happened to be on the West Coast, on a West Coast tour for CORE. It was a great success, and so they heard about it and then sent a kid down to interview me. I was on the road and busy. I said liberal, for example. He thought I meant Stalinist. And I said, forget it, not if I have to go through all this again. I wouldn't talk to the cat for three days. Then somebody said, they're going to do it anyway, Jimmy. You'd better go talk to them. 
I finally got him drunk, and the rest, they say, is history, or rather, should I say, time. Here, Baldwin clearly demonstrates his understanding of the ways that time could and would manipulate his image in order to bend it to the agenda at hand. In this somewhat offhand comment, he notes the strange pairing of his interviews in California with news of the Birmingham campaign. He also notes Roger Stone's awkward and irritated stance toward the assignment. Stone could not hear Baldwin, could not help but aggressively translate the word liberal to Stalinist, could not find his ease with the man except through drink. The result was the ungainly presentation of times boozy, effeminate, overblown, harsh, and yet comfortingly liberal version of Baldwin, an image that Baldwin resists in this interview by pairing himself with Gloria Richardson, the leader of the Cambridge Nonviolent Action Committee, CNAC, which spearheaded the Cambridge movement a successfully militant anti-segregationist and civil rights effort based on Maryland's Eastern Shore. The grand irony, however, was that even this expression of Baldwin's unruffled awareness of the clumsy and brutish mechanics of celebrity took place within the bounds of Cavalier Magazine's desire to have Baldwin's image burnish their own. The magazine was founded in the early 1950s with the mandate to publish edgy and experimental short fiction. What followed were years of success in which Cavalier published Jimmy Breslin, Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury, Nat Hentoff, William Bradford Huey, Stephen King, Thomas Pynchon, Robert Shelton, and Theodore Sturgeon, among others. By the time of Charles's interview with Baldwin, however, Cavalier was well on its way toward becoming a much less well-edited and more down-market version of Playboy. This meant that the interview was designed to place Baldwin's image in line with the aspirations of Cavalier's striving, acquisitive, and largely white heterosexual male identified readership. Charles writes a bumbling introduction to the interview in which he muddles his discussion of Baldwin and his oeuvre with images of Cavalier's version of the good life. I became marked for life by Baldwin while in bed with a famous authoress who had a fixation for conversation at the most inappropriate times. She simply asked, have you read James Baldwin? My ignorance of Baldwin on that occasion met with us for the rest of the evening. It was disturbing to say the least, encountering Mr. Baldwin in this way. Charles goes on to intersperse his prose with references to a mysteriously privileged map of Baldwin's life, painting the famed writer as a subject about whom one endlessly gossiped and sometimes spied drinking in village bars. I'd heard, for instance, from a beautiful lesbian left stranded in Mallorca by a certain play, um, paperback publisher that Baldwin helped pay her transportation back home. Then, from a young Negro photographer, I was told how Baldwin had paid for $1,000 of his equipment, telling him to go out and use it. The radically liberated consciousness of Cavalier's early literary years had, by the time of this interview, given way to a penchant for consumption and a tongue-in-cheek pseudo-sophistication about sex. At all rates, we see Baldwin's profile used once again to paper over the author's complicated aesthetics and radically complex understandings of human subjectivity in order to accommodate the clumsiest and most brutal forms of social and ideological posturing. It is unsettling to consider just how much of Baldwin's energy was taken up with print, radio, and television interviews, public readings of his work, appearances at fundraisers and meet rallies, meetings with teachers and students, award ceremonies, dinners, and luncheons. One is unnerved both by the awareness of the sheer toll all this activity must have had on his physical and emotional health, as well as the surprising hunger demonstrated by Baldwin's various audiences, a hunger that it speaks, I believe, to a need for the, for the new narratives of black subjectivity and interracial relations that presumably only Baldwin could offer. The young genius helped Americans to understand and articulate the sea change in culture 
affect and sociality brought about by the end to formal segregation in the country. At the same time, new American community seemed capable of dispensing with the requirement for either representative race men or the fantasy of an ancient and repressed black nobility. One of the hundreds of persons who wrote Baldwin during the hat of his celebrity was Alex Haley, the ghost writer of the autobiography of Malcolm X, Malcolm X, 1965, and the author of the wildly successful 1976 novel, Roots, The Saga of an American Family. Haley sent at least 12 letters to Baldwin in 1967 while he was doing research for Roots. Baldwin, meanwhile, was ranged between the United States, France, and Turkey as he attempted to complete Tell Me How Long the Train's Been Gone. Haley makes no secret of the fact that much of what attracts him to Baldwin is the author's flashing cosmopolitanism. In an undated handwritten letter to Jimmy and David, Baldwin's younger brother, Haley writes, here I sit at breakfast in Switzerland, baby. It's a hell of a long way and in more than merely miles from Henning, Tennessee. It is after awakening very early and bumbling about in the room and bath and foyer filled with thinking how to reorganize to spend much time in Europe. For instance, I have reflected how beautifully and preferably Baldwin, love that title, can be interviewed and written here rather than in the US. Things generally already are falling into place. It is Haley's no nonsense relinquishing of any sense of propriety or reserve that catches in the imagination as we read these lines. He has no patience at all for coy posturing. Instead, Haley embraces a quite familiar attitude, at least one admit familiar in the United States, of multinational, multiracial comfort and respectability. From Tennessee to Switzerland, he leads us to understand that he has landed in a cozy hotel suite, ready to relocate to Europe where he might not only survive but prosper, becoming relatively rich in the process. For his part, Baldwin acts as the mirror against which this thickly mundane vision of a liberated American intellectualism is reflected. Haley approaches him as a creative peer, someone who understands that the work of the call of the machine, as he would have it, can only be approached and answered, answered after one ministers to the tedious and the extraneous. Europe becomes for Haley a location of relief and a certain post-racial ease that finds its clearest expression in the person of James Baldwin himself. What really startles though, what chokes, is the surprising news that Haley wanted to write a biography of his idol entitled simply enough Baldwin. In a letter dated January 14, 1967, he wrote to Jimmy that his meeting with Tony Curtis to discuss the actors playing the role of Melvin Belly, attorney Melvin Belly, in a proposed biopic went well. He also reiterated his excitement about the idea of a biography. Quote, and yes, we both, we've both got much to do in between. But I find myself repeatedly anticipating the research and writing of Baldwin, a great book, I feel it, you know? The subject of Baldwin, or more precisely, the subject of Haley's feelings about a proposed project tentatively called Baldwin, became a dominant theme in his correspondence. The work was clearly meant to extend the wild success that Haley had had with the autobiography of Malcolm X and that he would have with Roots. Even more to the point, it would reiterate and expand the celebrity status that Baldwin achieved when his face appeared on the cover of Time. Haley wanted to produce an iconic text, one in which Baldwin's biography would act as a stand-in for a deeper, more elemental tale of creativity and African-American experience. Writing on January 23rd, 1967, Haley wraps Baldwin in a thick blanket of promises, compliments, and predictions about how the two will work together to finish the proposed biography. There isn't a project that I have pending to which I feel truly subjectively more committed, he begins. There is, for one thing, my indelible respect that you went through all that it took to blast through and make it 
really do it, which really was done for all us brethren who write or who purport to, we all benefited from the new respect legacy and then what it meant to all the rest of the brethren generally. You know the voice when there hadn't really been that kind of voice in our immediate time, power of the pen, all of that. Already, of course, you know me too well to feel I'm puffing you. It's the way I feel. And this man needs chronicling definitively. For now and for future, when we're all gone and those unborn now are studying us and what happened in the various areas, facets, and I will be very damn frank, I feel privileged that I will be the one to do it. I'm very patient, very thorough, and when I want, I can write. I'm right of you, for you, I will. Strangely, James Baldwin, the prolific novelist, essayist, playwright, and critic is hard to discern in these lovely sentences. From the very first, Haley turns toward the hagiographic, a, histor a discursive, discursive mood that forces sensitive writers to push beyond puffing in order to create a necessary and future-oriented chronicle of the man who ushered in the new respect legacy. In lieu of a flat-footed discussion of the humdrum realities of years of disciplined creation, Haley focuses on a sort of ethereal, not quite real conception of the grand writer Baldwin becomes a voice powerful enough to answer the needs of the brethren, both the living and the yet to be born. This is then answered later, later in the letter by a sort of obsessive focus on the quotidian. Haley warns Baldwin that, quote, gonna want to know what you wait, when you wait, where, what, when, where you wrote, and how. What you wore, how broke you were, our frustrations, bitternesses, happinesses, everything. Before I get done asking questions, you are going to get good damn and sick of me." End quote. For Haley, the biographic practice that he imagines is one in which the saintliness of his subject might be accessed through reference to the quality of his food, clothes, finances, schedule, and everyday emotions. He wanted to do with Baldwin what he, had achieved, he wanted to achieve with Baldwin, what he had achieved already with Malcolm X. He wanted to announce a people's genius and grace through recourse to the lived realities of a single and singular individual. He wanted to establish Baldwin as an unassailable African-American icon, and he was proudly confident that he could get the job done. It is telling that for his part, Alex Haley punctuates his letters to Baldwin with not only compliments designed to encourage the senior artist embrace of the idea of another biography, but also with sometimes detailed descriptions of the archival work that he was doing in preparation for the writing of Roots. On August 20th, 1967, Alex Haley wrote Baldwin to congratulate him on completing the manuscript for his novel, Tell Me How Long the Train's Been Gone, and to detail the remarkable discoveries he had made during his own research. Two weeks ago, I went through over 1,100 itineraries of slave ships, and I found her unquestionably, the ship that brought my forebear, Kinta Kinte. She was the Lord Legionnaire, built in New England in 1765 and 1766, she went to London, thence to Africa, thence to Annapolis, landing with 98 slaves, alive of her 140 taken on board at James Fort Gambia, Africa. I have by now found, or am, clo or am closing in on, every available minute detail about her. Have been to about every research source institution that's relevant in Washington, Annapolis, New England, et cetera, and next month, I'm going to London. The book will open on that day, July 15th, 1766. She, on that day, July 15th, 1766, she sailed from London, bound to Africa. The beginning of a sweeping black saga, Jimmy. I've got a big one, baby. What is staggering, heartbreaking, really, is how radically successful and how disastrously tragic Haley's sweeping black saga turned out to be. Of course, Haley 
did win grand critical and financial success with the publication of Roots. The initial reception of the 1976 novel, time to be released during the country's bicentennial, could not have been more impressive. Telling the story of Kunta Kinte, a young man stolen from 18th century Gambia and shipped to the United States, where he founded a family whose multi-generational saga the novel recounts, the shock and the promise of Roots rested on the ways in which it helped to reframe the uncomfortable and rarely discussed history of enslavement into the dominant narratives of American culture, identity, and vibrancy. Like European immigrants, African Americans could now point to a specific homeland from which they were taken as fully formed, complicated, and at times noble people with an even nobler past. The novel spent 46 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, including 22 in the number one position. In 1977, it was adapted into a first of its kind Emmy and Peabody Award winning miniseries, followed by a second one, Roots, The Next Generation in 1979. For his efforts, Haley received both a Pulitzer Prize and a National Book Award. In both instances, the book earned special citations that pointed to the fact that it was neither fish nor fowl but instead half fiction, half fact or faction, as Haley sometimes called it. Still, even with this bright and remarkable reception still unfolding, the serious problems with the novel were becoming increasingly apparent. Alex Haley was sued for plagiarism in the spring of 1977 by Harold Corlander, the author of a 1967 novel, The African, and Margaret Walker, author of the 1966 work, Jubilee. While the charges brought by Walker were eventually dropped, Haley was forced to pay $650,000 to Corlander, from whose earlier work he had taken large portions of the material included in Roots. More damaging still, damaging still. Haley's claims to have traced his family lineage back to the village of Jafur in the Gambia were seriously, indeed devastatingly, challenged. The head of the Gambian National Archives made it clear that the information Haley claimed to have taken from a griot, Keba Kanga, Keba Kanga Fofana, could not be reliable, because, both because Fofana's status as a true griot was in question, and because during his stay in Jafur, Haley had spent so much time telling the story of Kunta Kente's early life and capture that he had, in fact, effectively created the familial ancestral storyline that he later heard repeated by Fofana. More important for our treatment of Haley's relationship to Baldwin, however, is the fact that Haley's keen interest in writing his hero's biography and capturing the voice and legacy that he believed Baldwin represented was also caught up with the need to establish a noble and triumphant narrative of African-American life and identity that though attractive was and is largely inaccurate. Much of why I'm so resistant to the practice of what I've called hagiography, as I launch my own study of James Baldwin's life and art, stems from the recognition that my work is deeply beholden to a rich body of archival materials that even in their impressive scope only ever touch the surface of the grand artist, revealing very little of the private man, while opening up masses of information about how that man was perceived and how he himself worked to bend and manipulate that perception. At the same time, I must admit that I'm at once frightened and weary of treatments of celebrated and iconic intellectuals that turn on a sense of mournfulness and disappointment the drive to find the real man beneath the material that he left in his wake is not only an effort to return to the root to find a simple and inviolate base from which one might refashion the celebrity genius's work and actions, but also a desire to uncover fault and lost promise. If, as with Alex Haley, we set out to reveal noble lineage through the production of a character like Kunta Kinte, then inevitably we run directly into the problem 
that human beings up close and smelling of life's hurry and funk will always disappoint. Sitting on a stage in Sevilla, forwarding these arguments to a largely African-American, mainly English-speaking audience, I was startled by a probing question from a gifted cultural critic, and I should say a cultural critic who is at a, um, a professor at Humboldt University. She asked, but isn't there a place for black fantasy? I sputtered an answer, never having considered or even imagined such an idea. I think now that she was right. Fantasy and the fantastic are extremely important to the production and reproduction of politics and culture. Where I continue to be hard headed and resistant, however, is in my understanding that fantasies, black or otherwise, never arrive uncooked. The idea of a noble African past is central to African American thought and life, but it is difficult and perhaps impossible to separate that notion from either the shame that we are, in fact, the descendants of the benighted slave, or the reality that each of us, even and especially the best and most vibrant among us, can never, should never, live lives that are absolutely in sync with the most cherished ideals of the larger community. I will attempt then to take James Baldwin's story, his many stories, at face value. He was an artist and an activist, struggling mightily with words and images. He left, left us the miracle of countless finely wrought sentences, each crafted with the intent of allowing us to see ever more clearly the complicated social and aesthetic bonds that at once bundle us into the velvet comfort of a noble and ever striving community and allow us rhetorical cover as we sat with animal labor upon each other's throats. Thank you ever so much. All right. Uh, thank you, Robert, for a, a wonderful talk. Uh, as I said before, our audience, our invisible audience, it's, it's still uh, quite quite uh, uh, strange not to see anyone, but we have quite a big crowd. Uh, uh, there are more than 230 people uh, uh, here right now. Uh, and they will get to ask questions now. Uh, and uh, uh, to do so, please use the Q&A function that you should see at the bottom of your screen. So do not use raised hands uh, uh, because I, I can't call on you directly. And also with, with uh, 230 people in the audience, I can't see the, 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 the raised hands. Um, but you can type your questions in the chat and then I will read them out. Uh, probably not all of them, but, but all the questions and comments, they will be saved and they will be given to Robert. Um, and while you're uh, 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 writing, uh, let me chat a little bit with uh, 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 Robert. So uh, let me see. So in a way you talked about a, a, a failed biography of Baldwin here, which is now going to become part of another not failed biography of Baldwin. Hey. Hey. Uh, and then in the beginning, however, you also talked about, um, I don't know, a strange case of mistaken canonization almost, you know, mm -hmm. a Time Magazine's attempt to cast Baldwin as a black centrist and an American race translator. Uh, uh, but then they also turn him into a somewhat grotesque figure and grotesque celebrity. Um, now, there are so many things to say about this. Let me perhaps start with something that uh, I would just be curious to hear your thoughts on, um, because I think it relates to this question of Baldwin's Americanness and his American iconicity or celebrity status. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how Baldwin later in his life then, like, like many African uh, uh, American intellectuals actually, he goes to Europe of all places. And, and sure. unlike Haley breakfasting in Switzerland, he goes there to live there and, and actually to learn another language and to speak another language. But then he also stresses that he lives in Europe as an, as an American, 
because I, I think those are his words. He, I, I think he says something like, if I lived in Europe as a European, it would be a much less attractive um, uh, 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 continent. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, and I don't know, I, I, I've often been fascinated with this because it's not quite American expatriate modernism. It's not quite post-war leftist internationalism, even though both of these traditions are important, but there seems to be another dimension here that perhaps contrasts Haley's nobility Baldwin with a more, I don't know, fugitive Baldwin. Right. So, I mean, against the background of, of uh, 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 Baldwin as an American, an American literary celebrity, the importance of living abroad and especially of multilingualism for Baldwin. Right. What, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, it's funny because I, you know, um, the thing that you were referencing is that James Baldwin left, um, uh, lived in more or less in Greenwich Village um, until about 1948, until he was 24 years old. And then he went for nine years um, to, um, to Paris um, came back for um, back and forth often, um, and then he died in Saint Paul de Vence, um, yeah. uh, and owned a house in Saint Paul de Vence until the end of his life. I don't understand it all. I understand the first two years though, uh, so I can tell you, talk to you about it um, 1948 to 1950 because he talks about it, and also because it resonates quite um, deeply with me in a way that Frank you'll you'll understand I think, and that is the Bolton says that he went to um, France for the quiet. Mm -hmm. um, and part of what that meant was um, that part of what you get um, as an Anglophone person um, in France, not so much in Germany at this point, but you definitely get it in France, is you get the ability to not understand. You know, so one of the things that was super attractive to him is that, in fact, he could not, he was not very good in French for the first two years that he was there. He was very, had uh, real troubles communicating with um, uh, with French speaking people who did not speak English uh, for two years. Uh, and because of that, he was in a sense forced to live in a very large expatriate community um, in Paris because of the war and the GI Bill. There were lots of folks there, um, many of whom um, were also not French speaking, some of whom actually um, stayed for a long time, but many of whom never learned the French language. And he liked the fact that he was um, not competent in that way because he believed that he could not finish his own work um, uh, because he was too bombarded both with the sound of um, New York City um, and the way that we use our language, but also, and if you go to New York, the way that we're continually using our language, um, but also um, with the fact that he needed to get outside of that, um, the cultural milieu of um, Greenwich Village, which had, has, you know, we think of Greenwich Village as unbelievably accepting and sort of everything goes, but it had very much its own rules and very much its own ways of thinking about particularly modern and post-war um, conceptions of art and culture. I can't really speak to the fact after 1948, and so this, that I know, okay. after, uh, excuse me, 1950 or so, okay. and certainly in the end years of his life, one of the things that surprises me, and this is particularly important because it's something that I wanna sort of figure out while I'm um, here um, at the American Academy, is the fact that no one ever really talks about the fact that Baldwin was also a, um, a in Paris at the moment at which, uh, which uh, at a moment which was the heyday uh, for particularly a literary and a philosophical tradition that Americans consumed yeah. grandly and that we very much continue to consume um, long after many of those traditions are very much out of out of favor um, with our counterparts in France, but we never talk about Baldwin as um, a French and in, French intellectual. I'll tell you what guess. I'll tell you yeah. my guess about this. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps directly related to this. I mean, again, asking you as a biographer now, what is the role of Baldwin's sexuality in this regard, his queerness? Uh, I mean, which seems to affect all levels of his work. I mean, I always find, you know, one of the challenges of teaching Baldwin actually is that he is both representative and untypical of so many things at the same time. So, I mean, he contributes to all kinds of important cultural debates of his time, but he's always slightly at odds with any political movement or aesthetic movement that he comes in touch with. And I, and, and I think this has to do with his queerness also. So his queerness, queerness also in the sense of, I don't know, a desire, uh, that will not be pinpointed to one object and will not stay with one object or object choice. 
my feeling is that this sense of never fully belonging, you know, always seeing things slightly askew. Um, you, that you, this, that you're, this, yeah. You're asking exactly the right and exactly the wrong question. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Um, I literally, um, in the last two weeks, have listened to an interview with James Baldwin um, that is not public, in which he says that he needed to go to France in order to deal with his sexuality. And he specifically says he needed the quiet of France in order to be able to come to grips or come to terms with, or to understand what his sexuality actually was. That one of the things that certainly was happening to him, remember, Baldwin was also raised as a Pentecostal. And so that one of the things that was happening was that there were so many narratives of sex and sexuality that were available to him in New York City. None of those narratives actually fit for him. And probably none of those narratives actually fit very well for, um, for anybody. And this, I'll tell you why I'm saying that you're, so you're exactly right about this. And definitely going to France and remember France, at least for American people, is imagined as a place. Uh, and certainly after the war, this is definitely true. It was imagined as a place that is um, free around matters of sexuality and, uh, and comportment. Here's the other thing. Um, when you look at the um, lead up to um, Baldwin's uh, actually leaving that country and, um, and going to France, he is in his um, correspondence um, talking at length, um, not so much of directly about his sexuality, but also, but also about his gender identity, meaning that the um, many narratives that are available to him around gender identity um, didn't work. And especially because I think that we forget about this in the US in particular, and I think it's a thing that we share, the US shares with German um, people and um, German history and culture. The 1940s, the uh, Second World War was a crisis for men. And part of what is happening is that you are seeing large numbers of men killed, large numbers of men maimed, um, at the same time that the country is definitely imagining itself as macho and big shouldered and, uh, and, and, um, and masculinist, um, you are also seeing all of these men coming home literally with um, grave wounds um, and sometimes being hidden, frankly. So that he is quite explicit about the fact that he doesn't have a way to as a small um, and um, uh, sort of brown skinned, um, I guess effeminate man, I don't quite know what that word really means. Um, uh, but certainly that is the way that he has been described. It doesn't have a way to come to understand what it means for him to be a, a man, um, uh, to be a cisgendered man, we would say today, um, in the sort of suffocating um, argument, the suffocating argument that never actually gets to be counted as an argument in the States around masculinity. Though he writes about it a lot in his private, um, in his private discourse. And you see it, once you see that, you see him talking about um, issues of, uh, about gender um, and sexuality, always at the same time um, throughout his career in a way that, uh, frankly, um, I think is actually um, ends up being not particularly fulfilling for anybody. So that one of the things about James Baldwin is that um, we know that he is a person who had um, sexual and romantic relationships with men. He talks about that explicitly a lot. But he never uses the term gay. He doesn't like it. Uh, and he's hard to re... Um, uh, to, re, uh, to bring into the uh, sort of um, uh, the iconography around um, gay first and gay forefathers and gay foremothers and all of that, partially because he was really resistant to, to the way in which we were changing in the U.S. to think about um, gender differences um, that he thought were just as rigid as what happened before the war. That would be my guess. Okay, okay. So let me see. I, I have to navigate a few um, uh, 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 of the questions here. And, and let, me, uh, let me read out some of them uh, that were being asked. I apologize for not reading out the names of the people uh, uh, who asked questions. The reason is simply that this event is being recorded. So for legal reasons, we're not supposed to identify people in the audience now. Uh, so it is kind of anonymous, even though there are people that both of us know. Um, and let me see. Um, so um, uh, here's a question. I'm curious in regard to the title of your talk, American Icon. Um, how would Baldwin define America, American in relation to the concept of icon? Um, uh, so so the, the, the person who asked the question here also thinks of you know, people like Buffalo Bill, William Cody and his identity mm -hmm. as, an, as, an, as an American icon. That's a very interesting question. And the answer is, I don't know. 
<laughs> you know, uh, I can't answer that question. Um, what I can say is this. Um, when Baldwin was writing, um, part, of the, part of the reason I'm so um, a bit of a pain in the you know what about um, not wanting to go searching for secret facts about James Baldwin, although I find a fair amount of them, um, is that he wrote about biography a fair amount. And he says explicitly, especially if you take a look at a review he did of um, Shirley Graham's um, biography of um, um, Frederick Douglass, I believe, um, that one of the things that happens is that we tend to imagine that you get, um, we produce icons by imagining that you can understand, if you understand all of the details of their, uh, of their intimate life, that you will understand how it is that they became um, the individual that they became or how they became the symbol that they became. He believed very strongly that that was impossible. That the more you talk about, um, I think the phrases, um, the phrases that he uses, what, this per what conversation this person had with his wife at the dinner table or what he was thinking when he was walking through the woods, that the further actually you get from that person, because that the goal of those types of questions is never really to know that person. The goal is really to figure out, to get a sort of recipe going that allows you to produce it, that individual as in fact an icon. Mm -hmm. That's, so that's what I know. The reason I'm being a, a little bit coy is that um, I don't, I try not to ventriloquize James Baldwin. I try very hard to not do it. Yeah. So that I'm now talking as myself. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I think that you, when you start to look at iconization processes or look at who we think of as, um, uh, at least in the US as an icon or a true hero, I think even if you look at recent um, folks in, in our political past, recent past, um, that you'll find that we actually are very turned on by the idea of um, the broken hero, the mm -hmm. wounded individual, that we like that chink in the armor that allows us to see, oh, there's a real human being underneath that. Um, but I think that when you get down to how that actually works, why we need that, why we need heroes who are always sort of broken or abused or who are fallible or who have real emotional, mental, and um, all sorts of problems is a question that I think that we have not, we've not really answered and why we're, why we're so um, consumed with those types of individuals and like that type of particularly broken man, broken big man, you know, um, is something that, that worries me. And it's part, and so it's, I'm not trying to turn James Baldwin into an icon. I'm trying to show that process of iconization, which I know turns largely on um, this, this tendency, literally you see it in the same sentences. James yeah. Baldwin is a genius. James Baldwin is a leader. James Baldwin is a wonderful person. James Baldwin is an alcoholic. James Baldwin smoked too much. James Baldwin um, was ugly. James Baldwin was effeminate. Literally in the same sentences. That that I thought at first was something um, out of sync. But when you start to look at the entire body of both his writing and writing about him, it is omnipresent. There are actually a couple of questions about the, the recent uh, uh, Baldwin Renaissance, if you want to call it this. Uh, uh, so, so here is one. Um, uh, uh, do you have any thoughts on recent representations of Baldwin, his legacy and his work in recent popular screen media, for example, the Barry Jenkins film adaptation of Beale Street, mm -hmm. or Raoul Peck's 2016 documentary? How would they compare to his representation in some of the popular text archives you've dealt with during his lifetime? Um, I, um, I have to say first and foremost that I very much um, liked um, both uh, I'm Not Your Negro, I think it has a problem, but I enjoyed it very, very much. And I also um, liked um, Barry Jenkins's film at Bill Street Could Talk. I, I liked it very much, although I think it has problems. Uh, that all said, um, if I can again skirt that, that, skirt that question as well, um, I just was um, reading work uh, by someone, uh, by people who are doing work in uh, digital humanities. And James Baldwin's quotes have become um, some of the most uh, common memes in, um, in Twitter. Like there, so there are, people are continually quoting James Baldwin. The thing that you find is one, he's often misquoted. Um, and two, um, one, and, and the Twitter thing is particularly strange um, because um, Twitter only allows 140 characters. James Baldwin never wrote a sentence that was only 140 characters long. Um, it's, he's a very, very recursive writer. He's a very, very complicated thinker. 
And so I think that part of what happens is that you see in this um, attempt to sort of reevaluate uh, re Baldwin and attempt to de um, to simplify him ultimately yeah. in a way that I think um, actually gets us further away from from what he said. And so um, that's why I try not to um, ventriloquize him because I could say James Baldwin would be for uh, Black Lives Matter. I, I'm, I think that that is probably valid, but the way in which James Baldwin would say that sentence would be would he would still be saying that sentence in a way that all of that other complexity makes makes it makes a grand difference for him. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, here, here's here's another interesting one about celebrity. Um, um, so the person asked, I was wondering if you could speak to Baldwin's treatment of celebrity in his fictional and non-fictional work. Some of oh. the characters in his novels and short stories are celebrities. Does any of his reflection overlap with his own experience as an icon? My work here is done. <laughs> oh my God. Um, I, uh, I don't know who that person is, but stay in your own lane. You know, uh, and that uh, I, one of the things that part of the reason I can't get past the celebrity stuff is effectively all of the fiction is about celebrity. Even when you're talking about um, the first two novels, um, Go Tell Down the Mountain, you're talking about um, uh, it centers on, um, uh, on a minister, um, on the son of a minister, and the minister had once been on the rise as a celebrity minister. And when you're talking about David from Giovanni's Room, the, the Baldwin's gay novel, gay novel, um, that one of the things that he's very concerned about, the first images in it, um, is that the first words in it are about his being concerned about the way that he looks and um, looking at himself in the mirror. And the, part of the reason that the relationship with Giovanni breaks up is because he's concerned not so much about what it means to have sex with a man, but he's concerned about what it means to have people look at him and know that he's having sex with a man. Baldwin as a child, as a child, uh, when you look at his writing, and uh, he was the editor at DeWitt Clinton High School, high school, by the way, that graduated a billion celebrities. Um, he um, was concerned with how it is that individuals are concerned with the way that, um, the way that we are perceived. I don't, again, I don't have a proper answer to the question. What I can say is this, that I think that Baldwin understood that the, this concern with how we're seen in public and how we um, don um, a certain type of armor uh, to allow us to be seen in public and to be represented in a certain way is intensely American. It is intensely, it's at the center of our culture. Um, we, are, we are people who um, will say things like be natural and then we apply lots and lots of products in order to make ourselves um, natural. Um, and we are people who are very much concerned with getting to the real, and we use all sort of, uh, sorts of artifice to get to the real. It, if you look at this, if you look at Baldwin's writing from beginning to end, this question is a question of his. And I'll tell you a little secret um, that um, uh, in Baldwin's late life, uh, he, um, uh, I think the last thing he published was um, the last novel that he published was just about my head, about a, uh, um, uh, a famous singer, gospel singer. Um, and also um, the last um, um, collection of essays he published was the evidence of things unseen uh, about this whole um, idea that Americans shield ourselves, that we are, we are people who are very much concerned with uh, bailing. But also um, he has a load of unpublished stuff that treats um, celebrity. So there's an, um, a no, um, treatment for a novel for a famous athlete. The welcome table is all about a famous actress coming to um, visit what looks like Saint Paul de Vence. Um, and there's just there's a famous there's a novel treatment about a famous artist. He's very very much concerned about what the distinction between the person, um, the close to the body person, actually is in the way that that person is actually perceived. And he thinks of the 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 that that those acts of dressing that person of putting on a set of desires onto, um, onto individuals is deadly to us. Um, and something that he thinks is not distinct from the way in which we think about race in the United States. I think actually I'll, I'll, I'll step out on a limb. You know, the Americans have been very, very resistant until recently, by the way, of, um, to wearing masks during the, um, during the um, epidemic. Part of it is that we're, people are serious about this idea that you have to see the naked face of, uh, of individuals. It's a, it's a thing that's important to the culture um, and that all of us participate in, and I mean left and right, black and white, um, or, and everybody else, right, 
in ways that I think, but ways that are so omnipresent for us that we just don't even understand the practice of it. We don't understand why we're that way and don't understand, uh, we understand when people are breaking the rules, but we don't know what the rules actually are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Here, here is a, a more detailed question, but, but an interesting one. Uh, can you tell us a little more about Roger Stone from San Francisco? I think nothing, I know nothing, I know nothing about it, and I do not think that it's the Roger Stone from- It's not, it's not that, that was I was thinking, but, 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 but there's, there's an interesting uh, observation here. Uh, uh, so, so the same person says, I think he gets that awful shadow ma metaphor uh, that turns up in time from a 1929 poem by Alan Tate, of all people. So, uh, my I, thoughts. Um, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad that I don't know the name of the person who's told me this because I will be stealing that information. I have stolen. Oh, you will get to see the name later on. <laughs> I have stolen the information. Yeah. Uh, <sighs> Yeah. So, so, okay. Okay. So, so, so here's another one. And uh, many of these questions are about, you know, hey, geography, celebrity, and so on. So, uh, given your engagement with Alex Haley's attempt at memorializing James Baldwin, I'm curious about your take on James Baldwin's attempt at memorializing Malcolm X, which would become the basis of Spike Lee's hey, geographic movie. <sighs> <sighs> <laughs> that real, my, I've just given my real answer to this. Yeah. Um, uh, in that I don't know. Um, and I hear, can I speak to the heart of that question and, and tell you, I can tell you why I don't know. I can tell you what I don't know. Yeah. And that is, though I'm taking from Baldwin himself, loads and loads of cues that says that he's very explicit about this idea that in fact, um, one of the things that happens is that um, celebrities are swamped and killed by their um, by their fans. Mm -hmm. um, he says it a lot and says it in exactly that blunt and uh, that um, straightforward way. At the same time, it is absolutely the case that Baldwin participates in grand style in, cele in U.S. celebrity culture, mm -hmm. grand style, including um, that what I don't show you, what I didn't show you today in the in the conversation, in the letters between Alex Haley and um, and um, James Baldwin, was his talking at length about Alex about um, Alex Haley's um, um, about the autobiography of an Alec, um, of of Malcolm X written by Alex Haley, and about um, work that Baldwin did in order to support uh, Betty Shabazz um, after Alex Haley, uh, after um, Malcolm X's death, plus. Um, he was the, if you look at um, I'm Not Your Negro, it is all about his mourning of Malcolm X, um, Medgar Evers, and Martin Luther King, and his sense of trying to turn these men in the American consciousness into something like human beings again. However, that um, fragment that um, was the narration for I'm Not Your Negro was not available to the public until I'm not your Negro. So I don't understand, I, you know, so part of the reason I'm, I'm hesitant and so clumsy right now is that Baldwin really played both sides of the fence on this. He really, really did. Um, and he talked explicitly about the problems with celebrity and celebration and participated actively in, uh, in those problems. So I haven't, I haven't, you know, with the truth of the matter, I was gonna say I hadn't separated those things out the truth of the matter is I don't think that they're separated out, but I haven't figured out a, a way to say the sentences in some type of elegant manner. Mm -hmm. All right, I think uh, our time is nearing the end here. So so perhaps I get to ask another very, very quick question. Um, uh, uh, in, uh, I mean, in the, in the beginning, I talked about how uh, 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 you're, 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 you're such an, you're such a great writer, and I especially like your first sentences. You know, in in in, in, in books and essays, you always and then it's downhill from there. First sentences. <laughs> so I wonder what's going to be the first sentence of the of the Baldwin biography. That is mean. That is <laughs> mean question to ask, uh, and I'll tell you, it's mean because I have a fancy agent, and uh, we're in a pitched battle over this matter. <laughs> <laughs> we're in a pitched battle over this matter. Matter. I'll tell the sentence that I wanted to use, uh, but that nobody likes. And so, uh, but we'll see if it, make it makes it. Um, and that is, um, 
Emma Burgess Jones was in trouble. Um, uh, Emma Burgess Jones was Bald James Baldwin's mother. Um, things that um, what folks may not know is that James Baldwin, um, Emma Burgess Jones gave birth to her son and then married David Baldwin, her husband, uh, when James Baldwin was three. And so James Baldwin's first name was James Jones. Yeah. Um, and so, but one of the things that happens in our discussions of James Baldwin is that um, his mother, we never sort of talk about his mother um, and he very infrequently talks about his mother, where he talks incessantly about his father who was super abusive to him, his stepfather who was super abusive to him. And there is, um, I'm sure I will say these words and people will then say, oh my God, but the, here's the information you want. Um, there's very, very little information I, um, on uh, James Baldwin's biological father um, and none that I've been able to find in the, um, in the three big archives that I use. Mm -hmm. All right, so thank you, Robert, uh, and to the good people out there, thank you for joining us and, and asking questions. Uh, my apologies to everyone whose question we did not discuss tonight, but we will save all of them and, and Robert will get to see them with the names attached. Uh, so you haven't wasted your time. Uh, and with this, I think uh, uh, Daniel Benjamin uh, uh, would like to say a few concluding remarks. Yes, just very briefly, I wanna thank you both for a fabulous event. Robert, that was a terrific presentation. And Frank, uh, you interrogated him brilliantly. <laughs> and uh, I can only say uh, I'm astonished that Robert even answered the question about what the first sentence is. So um, <laughs> that is uh, something to follow up on. Um, but we are looking at a great, uh, a great term of conversation here at the Academy just based on this evening's uh, foray. So uh, before uh, we, um, we close this down, I just want to uh, let you know what the next uh, event will be uh, this Friday, March 5th, um, at the un somewhat unusual hour of 4 p.m. Central European time. Uh, we will have a book launch in cooperation with the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Studies in Amsterdam, the Radboud University in Nijmegen, and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which is a school I believe Robert knows well. Uh, this will be a transatlantic roundtable launching the publication of the Oxford Handbook of Gender War in the Western World since 1600. It was a comprehensive historical overview of the entangled relationships among gender war and military culture. The discussion will be moderated by Academy alumna, Karen Hageman, who co-edited the volume. And uh, panelists will be uh, Stefan Duding, Kimberly Jens Jensen, Susan Grazel, Thomas Kuna and Richard Smith. And then just to look ahead on March 11th uh, at 7.30 PM local time, we will host the next spring um, uh, 2021 fellows lecture, which will be delivered by Natalie Poitz, who is an associate professor of anthropology at NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, she will, um, uh, her talk is entitled Displacement in the Horn of Africa, Racialization, Migration and the United Nations, and she will share her insights from her ethnographic fieldwork with Yemeni migrants and refugees in Djibouti. So if you'd like to attend these talks, and we very much hope you will, uh, please go to our website, www.americanacademy.de, and register under upcoming events. And we look forward to seeing you. And now, um, Robert, I don't know if you're over your uh, jet lag or not, but, um, you have you have earned a respite, <laughs> and uh, Frank, you you've earned a respite too. So yes. thank you very much. Uh, it's been wonderful seeing you. Uh, thanks for bringing so many great people to our screen, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon. Good night. <laughs>